Okay, uh, well, thank you for having this conference in Berlin. <laughs> it's very nice to not be jet-lagged, but I'm nevertheless a bit exhausted, as most of you are probably. Um, so in, in the beginning of this workshop, I didn't actually know what to talk about, so at least I only knew the first part. But then I thought that some of the discussion was such that I, I should, you know, do the second part accordingly. So for those of you who are not uh, interested in quantum mechanics, too bad. Um, and you can go and have a nice sleep. It's fine. So let me just say what's my plan. So we do some machine learning for quantum chemistry. Um, this is some deep neural network stuff that I will have. That's the first part. And we will also link to the topic, the reoccurring topic of understanding and explaining in that context. The second part uh, of the talk will be also still about quantum mechanics, but this time working with very few data points. Because um, I remember that um, Tommy on the first night, he said, well, it wouldn't be, be nice to learn with very few data points. And there's actually a, an application where this is really mandatory that you learn with few data points. So, and I will discuss this a bit. Okay, so um, machine learning in physics and chemistry. So um, many of you have heard the story. So there's, uh, um, it starts in 2011 when I spent my sabbatical at UCLA at IPAM, a wonderful place, um, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics. Um, it's really very nice. I recommend you to go there. So it's, um, they have three month program. Uh, programs and you know usually if you have a sabbatical you go somewhere and then everybody is busy everybody that you actually intended to work with but there the program is such that that all these professors that are invited and their postdocs and students they have actually nothing else to do so, but to do research so this, they are not involved in daily teaching and so I uh, was the only machine learning dude among quantum chemists. And um, uh, I didn't really carefully look at the name of the program. So I was a bit astonished when in the first week everybody was talking about quantum mechanics and in particular about DFT. So, and what they t talked about was not the DFT that we are used to. So they talked about density functional theory, which is a way to approximate the Schrodinger equation, which is actually a beast if you want to solve it. So if you want to understand about molecules, it's, it's a good thing to, to solve the Schrodinger equation. So this is the Hamiltonian, this is the wave function, this is the energy, and the wave function again. It's an innocent looking eigenvalue equation, but unfortunately, it's very hard to solve. In fact, it can only be approximately solved. And um, DFT is a way to do this. Um, it got some Nobel prizes for it. And the idea is basically that that you make some, you start from first principles and then you make a number of approximations and in the end you can compute it. And typically for a small molecule, um, it takes about this, this DFT calculation, a, a reasonable one, takes about um, yeah, three to five hours per molecule. So, which is an explanation why you don't have such a data rich area. So, because it's a lot of, they're the m number one users of supercomputers next to the climate people. Right? So, um, by the way, uh, there's much more accurate computations um, of the Schrodinger equations called couple clustering, and they take one to seven days per data point. Okay, so, um, and what I suggested then was to say, well, if you do all this first principle stuff and then do some approximations sometimes at the end, why not, instead, 
um, treat this as a stochastic problem in the first place and just predict the outcome of the, uh, of the Schrodinger equation. So, which is a bit heretic, because you just put in what, what goes into the Schrodinger equation. In, in, in this case, it's the nuclear charges and, and um, atomic coordinates of a molecule. And um, out comes the energy or polarization or band gap or, or like. By the way, if you do um, quantum chemical calculation for a material, it will be rather four months or so of computing time. But it's, it's still much less time than actually producing material, which can easily take two years if you get it done. So, um, so what I suggested was to, to use machine learning to, in practice, um, just bypass an equation. So you could also do the same game with Navier-Stokes or some other equations. Um, and of course, nobody was pleased with this. Um, the physicist didn't like it, the chemist didn't like it, and the mathematician also hated me. But, as always, you, you find some adventurous people that would like to work on this. And this was uh, Alex Kachenko and Anatol von Lilienfeld, who are now in Luxembourg and Basel, and Matthias Rupert, the postdoc. Um, so, just to add something to the story, I discovered that I was actually originally trained as a theoretical physics, physicist, and I learned quantum mechanics and quantum field theory back in the days, right? But that was 89 or so. So, you know, I had to pull this out, and then um, after a while, we, we transformed this, this problem into a machine learning problem, and um, interesting enough, it, it actually worked. That was the most astonishing part. Um, and I will tell you about this. So, yes, the energies or polarizations, any kind of endpoints that you can think of. Yes, I mean, it's anything that you can get out of the Schrödinger, Schrödinger equation. Okay, so, so here's the data. There, there was one guy, uh, Jean-Louis Raymond, who, who enumerated all stable compounds, um, which is a lot. I mean, there are more um, uh, stable small molecules than atoms of the universe. And so um, the thing is, he just enumerated this, these molecules, but he, he didn't do the quantum chemical compilations uh, for obvious reasons. So, um, but we, we used these enumerated data up to seven heavy atoms, um, which is about 7,000 uh, molecules, that are small molecules. Um, and uh, Alex was putting them onto the Max Planck supercomputer, um, and then that was our training set. So now, how do you represent molecules? So the, the easy way to do this, so if you think about the molecule, then, then you have an atom I and an atom J. So the way we represented a um, molecule was just by the interaction between atom I and J. And we, we represented the molecule as a matrix, where we put the nuclear charges and we took the Coulomb force between every two atoms. So, so basically, you know, you would get a matrix like that. And then the next thing, this, we call this the Coulomb matrix. The next thing is how do we compare two compounds? Uh, we just take the Frobenius norm between these matrices. Very obvious. So then um, people thought, well, if we have this representation, we do something really smart. And I insisted that we do something very simple. Um, namely, we take a kernel method. We do kernel ridge regression. If it doesn't work with kernel ridge regression, no way it would work. Okay, so, um, so here's the kernel matrix where we have the Frobenius norm inside. This is some signal that we have to choose, and that's the prediction. So we, we have our training data where the molecules are, and we basically sum over all the kernels um, the Gaussian kernels of an appropriate size that is chosen by model selection, and we sum over them. That's just usual stuff. 
And of course, we can get this very quickly because, think about it, we have very few molecules only in our training set. So um, then, um, so basically, what we what we then did was we look at um, what are, what are the out of sample um, errors in the in predicting new uh, compounds, and we got something like 10 kcal at that time, um, just using the Coulomb matrix. Then the next step was to do a bit more adventurous stuff, namely do neural networks. So we could go down to 3.5 kcal, then we changed the representation, we were at 1.3 kcal, and then we did some more serious stuff and we are down below 1 kcal. And in fact, if you look at Christoph's poster over in the middle, that we are at 0.3 kcal now. Now, 0.3 kcal, what, what what is this about, right? So chemical accuracy is one kcal. So this is what is use, considered useful for a chemist. So this is out of sample, and any, kind, any of these prediction methods is about 10 million times faster. So this is a really big step forward, okay? So, so far, so good. So now let's do something more adventurous, right? <laughs> so, so there's the deep tensor neural networks that because of our first author there, we would like to call the Schnett. Uh, and uh, so basically it takes a representation of the nuclear charges, um, the distances um, between the atoms, and um, then we put this into an architecture like that, and I will try to explain what the, archi the archi architecture does. So we have the nuclear charges. So this is every every of these little boxes is for one atom of the molecule. So we put in the nuclear charges, then we put in the distances, and the idea is you have the distance distributions between the atoms of the molecule, and basically you would try to make a model how they are, right? So, because how they are distributed, because that's characteristic for, for a molecule. And you do this for um, every atom. Um, and then there's, of course, the nuclear charges. So, basically what you try to do, in a nutshell, is you, you try to do something like word to vec but for, for the chemical compound space. So in other words, you try to um, have something very complicated that is a graph in 3D with some complicated interactions, and you li like to ro roll this out into some kind of representation that is chemically meaningful and represents the, the local um, properties of an atom within a compound. So that's the idea. So in, in word to vec you do this in the sentence context, you look for what, how to embed a certain word in, in the sentence context. So now let's, let's discuss this in more detail. Um, so you first start by uh, initializing, so this is the small printed stuff. So, but it's no miracles here, so this is why I have these equations. So you start out um, with initializing the Cs. Remember these, these beasts here, okay? Um, then you make an expansions. You make an expansions of the interatomic distances, um, and you you just do a, some. You put a bunch of Gaussians on top of them, so that you can you know get this distribution right, um, and then. Of course, what, what is maybe not clear immediately from this picture is that there's some kind of a feedback loop, okay? So what you do is you first have a, a model where you construct the atomic environments, and the next thing is you, take, you, con you, you, you do this embedding within the interactions to the next atoms, and then you do this to the interactions with the you know, further down the graph. That's the principle. So in other words, you try to 
to understand what is the physics and the chemistry of this environment, but not only, you know, plainly look at, and at each atom, but, but a bit farther out. Okay. And you learn the whole stuff. That's also clear, I guess. Um, so this is like the interaction, and the interaction has this tensor component where we do a low rank approximation in order not to have too many parameters. That's also pretty standard in, in the um, tensor neural network field. So then, um, basically, that's the output, um, and we have some, some... So when we are done with our iterations, then we have some some waiting for the output and some bias, and then we sum it all. Uh, then, then we have the the energy uh, predictors for every single atom, and then we sum them up and standardize them in the in a meaningful. Uh, we standardize them and sum them up in a meaningful way. So that's the idea. Okay, so so that's just repeating everything, right? Um, and so basically, what you have is like you, if you if you roll this out, if you if it if you it's not so as compressed as in the the last picture. So if you roll out this feedback loop, what you actually do is you have this this expansion, and then that describes the local interactions of around an atom. So this representation is then put into the next layer where you do the interactions and so on and so forth, okay? So then you sum everything up. Now you can do chemistry with it. And first of all, the question is um, that, that we may want to ask is, if you're giving more training examples, how does it scale? How, how far can you get in your predictions? And how far can you get in your predictions if you consider only the atomic environments and if we take interactions into account? So you see that if you just consider the atomic environment, then you scale off at some point, which is not bad. 1.5 kcal is, is, is nice, but you can do better if you take higher interactions into account. And I think that's what chemists would tell you too, right? Because chemistry is about bindings and everything. So that's obviously what the model has also learned. Um, so. Um, we can go to 1.0 uh, kcal um, with about uh, 25,000 training examples. So, of course, I don't need to tell you that using 100,000 training examples in the kernel rich regression model, it would be a bit more on the difficult side, but um, maybe it's, it's a bit clear. So now, what I showed so far, this part, is that we are going across chemical compound space. In, in other words, we have all these small molecules, we take something out of our bag and predict something that we have never seen. Right? So, the next thing that we can do is we take one molecule and um, do MD, molecular dynamics. So, in other words, this, this is the molecule and, um, you know, the the atoms, they move around and this is called molecular dynamics. This is non-trivial and uh, uh, there's a huge field doing that. Of course, in this case, the learning problem is slightly different because it's about one molecule, and so you, what you have to do as training data is you have to, to generate a trajectory that is long enough. <laughs> and if we're talking about you know, usual trajectories, there are some picoseconds and it takes a year of computing time or something like that, right? So it's a, it's a serious stuff, right, in terms of computing time. So we can take some of that and say, take 25K, and then we can see whether as a function of time, if we, for example, consider this molecule, how the energy prediction is for that. So the energy prediction is indistinguishable bet between the model and the true prediction and this is out of sample, okay? So which means that basically the model that we have, the same model that we have retrained is able to do MD on the quantum mechanical accuracy. And the accuracy is much better than one kcal and needs to be much better than one kcal because MD requires more precision, okay? 
So you see, um, benzene is a simple molecule, but that malonaldehyde is already more difficult, and, and you cannot do as good, but it's good enough for all practical purposes. So this means that not only can we learn across chemical compound space, but we can also do MD with the same type of model. So now we can, can ask, well, after we've heard all these talks by Wojtek and Gregoire and Alex about LRP and explaining things, so we can wonder, so you remember the picture of the horse where the classifier, the Fisher uh, vector looked at the, the writing, the tag. So the model was actually doing something not meaningful, right? So the question is, is our deep neural network, is it actually learning some chemistry or is it just doing something, right? So that's the question. So it's accurate, but has it learned chemistry? That's the question now. That is a step too far. We just, you know, of course, Tali um, is asking the right question, but give us some time. We started this in 2011, right? Uh, so so the, then, I mean, we have this model. Um, so what we can now do is we can, we can keep the model fixed and, and um, introduce some, some probe charge and try to see what the model tells us about the probe charge. So in other words, we can, we can make these kind of nice, nice pictures. So, so assume, so this is now benzene. Assume that you were a hydrogen, where would you like to bind, for example? And you can make these nice gummy bear plots um, where you can see the distributions for hydrogen, carbon, and all sorts of things. So, so this looks very nice to a chemist. This looks also nice to a machine learning specialist because of the colorful plots. It's quite, uh, highly artistic, but it makes some sense, okay? So in other words, not only this is nice, but it also makes some physical sense. Okay, so now we can ask the question um, that is also asked sometimes. I mean, uh, the dream in machine learning, if you work with machine learning in the sciences, is that we discover something that we didn't know before. And of course, th the problem is that this almost never happens. And maybe we can have 10 cases where this actually happens, where we discover something really unknown. Uh, to people before. Usually we discover something and then the, the biologist tells us, ah, you know, this is clear, right? We know that already. So, um, so the question here, it's a bit more modest. Can we discover something that is not in the database, right? And here um, we ask, so assume that we take aromatic compounds, meaning that there's some ring in it. So, um, then we can ask, of course, what is the stability of these compounds, but that's already in the database. So this is nothing important. But we can ask, if I look at all these compounds that have all sorts of groups, can our model give us some prediction? Can, can it sort these compounds um, according to the stability of the aromatic ring? just the ring itself, so a part of the compound. It's not the full compound. And so our model can give an answer to that, which is meaningful. So, in other words, there's something that was not in the database, maybe it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's some new insight. Okay, so we can basically use this model to generate insights. Okay, so... All right, so... This is our model. This is the nice gummy bear plots. So it's towards chemical insights. Now, if we go one step further and just move slightly across the room to this poster, which I'm now advertising, so we can ask the question, ah, you've been using deep tensor neural networks. Have you used convolutional neural networks? And of course, 
it's an obvious question, right? And so this is the convolutional neural network that um, Christoph has been using. Put also the nuclear charges and the atom coordinates inside there. But now, if you do MD, something interesting comes about. So if you think about molecular dynamics, then there's a small wiggle uh, in the molecule. So assume that you take um, some usual convolutive neural network, which takes a discrete filter. Then the answer given, if I wiggle a bit, will be the same. So in other words, the standard convolutional kernel that is discrete is not good enough to look at the quantum mechanical problem, which is why Christoph um, has found the continuous filter version of it. It's something that, that you don't need in images or many other uh, questions. But here, it's quite obvious that it's necessary. We cannot, I mean, we, we cannot look at the fine-grained details of an MD movement without a continuous kernel. So, which motivated us to do continuous filters, and the deep tensor neural network was doing something like 0.7 kcal, we are now halving this, 0.3. So, which is quite nice. Okay, so now I will change gears slightly. I have to see what time, uh, how much time I have still. Ah, great. Okay, so, so now uh, learning with few data points. So already um, you may have thought that this is not many data points. So the, I think the deep tensor neural network or the, the convolutional neural network has been learning with 100,000 data points or so, but think about how much time you use for producing them, right? So it's not trivial. But here, I will be a bit more extreme, okay? And uh, this is the... Ah, by the way, the, the, the name of this network, you should be... So I will need to make some puns about things. Um, yes? Please wait for about 10 minutes. So, yay! <laughs> so, we can dis discover who's really <laughs> carefully attending the talk. So, a few data points. Again, MD. And so, this I should say that I have not talked about this part before. This is a new paper um, that has appeared a, a month or so ago. And Stefan Schmeler is, is sitting in the back here, right? So he's the first author. So now it, this is again another non-neural network approach to, to molecular dynamics. Um, and the idea that I will try to convey is, so this is like the short version and then you can go to sleep. So it's just, that if you use symmetries and if you use the laws of physics, then you may not need as many data points. So the whole discussion was, why can children learn with so few data points? Why can we solve some problems with so few data points? Obviously, there's a lot of knowledge in what we have learned so far. And here, this knowledge can be quantified and this is actually the laws of physics. Okay, so assume that you have a molecule for which you want to do molecular dynamics. Then you can, of course, project all the... the so then you have these, for every atom, again, a 3D coordinate. So this is a, in a 6-12-dimensional uh, uh, space, times 3-dimensional space, uh, moves the trajectory. So. Mm, there's, there's more to it. Um, so you can think of this as um, there, there being a potential energy, and if the uh, molecules wiggle around, then they won't wander around in the potential energy surface. 
So there will be some forces that they um, that they uh, feel, right? So in other words, if you if the molecule if if you have part of the compound and then one atom goes out, then it will be pulled back. So that's a force. So you don't only have the coordinates, but there may be also forces that you have. And the interesting thing is that in all these in, in all these quantum chemical co codes, you can get the forces almost for free. So so we can assume to have both the geometry and the forces. And now the question is how to do to put these things together and construct a potential energy surface. If we have a, con a really accurate potential energy surface, then we can, it's just a mechanical problem. We can just have the ball buzz around and then have the trajectory. So that's the idea. Um, and of course, there's a number of architectures that we can use from the machine learning side. There's different descriptors. I, I was talking about the Coulomb matrix before, but there's others. And one obvious um, law of physics that you can use is energy conservation. So if you do MD, then there's not more energy produced unless you, I don't know, shoot with a laser on this, but this is not the situation that we're considering. Okay? So how do we um, incorporate some prior that is a hard prior? We know that the laws of physics hold. Um, how can we Im include this in learning? And what um, does it do? So what can be done? Um, usually, I mean, and this is something that we have learned so far. So we have the coordinates and we can map to the energies. I think that this, I have done this exercise before. And then we can take the derivative of the energy, which is in this potential energy surface, gives you the force. Okay. So usually people go this way. But of course you should do the, the right thing, meaning predicting what you want to actually predict in the end. This is what Wapnik to told us. So this means that you predict the forces right away, and this is what we're going to do. And then, if you have the forces, you can go back and integrate, but you need this to be a conservative force field, otherwise this is not giving anything meaningful. Okay? So, that's the idea. Now, how do we do this? The, the standard way, I already uh, explained this, is to, to do the kernel rich regression model. So, um, and, and by this, minimizing the normal kernel rich regression error. Now, how do we go about to predict the forces? So, we, we take what is known in, in uh, machine learning, which is the old work by Michelli and Pontil, um, which basically tells us how, how we can do vectors, right? So basically, instead of having... So remember, here's the kernel matrix from our descriptor, and then we can compute um, the alpha in the, in the kernel rich regression expansion by just inverting this one. Now, it's getting a more, bit more interesting because on this side there will be the forces, so we have to derive a bit, and on this side there will be the um, Hessian of the energy, uh, of the kernel. So basically this is the same, so, so this, this would be an equation, a kernel rich regression equation for uh, predicting forces. Okay? So same, same thing here. So instead of, um, instead of just doing kernel rate regression, we are taking the, Hessians, uh, the Hessian of the kernel in this model. Now, this is well known, so nothing in principle new, except that we apply it in this context. So with this, we have the forces. Now, the, the thing is, if you think about a toy example, so this is now some, say this is your potential energy surface, and you sample from it, okay? Then um, you may predict the force field, 
then this force field may look like that, right? So what you get from this equation is a force field, but not a physical one. So this is no good, because we cannot integrate it then. So you can see this is not an integrable force field. Why? Because um, there's a sink in this, right? Sources and sinks are not conservative. So, in other words, if we are looking for a conservative force field, we'd rather have this constraint fulfilled, which is not fulfilled by this one. So, in physics, this is called a Helmholtz decomposition. So, we have some part which is conservative and some part which can contain sources and sinks. So, this is what we do. Okay? So, because you can see that this is a pretty good solution. So, in other words, if we just digest this a bit. So, we are, we are about to predict a force field, but there are so many force fields around. And we would just like to get these few that are conservative. We'd like to constrain it like that. Okay. Good. So, um, just to, to say, so we take a matern uh, kernel, um, and um, so this is the force field kernel function, and um, so this is uh, the, the descriptors, and um, we, we say, we call what we have done gradient domain machine learning. Okay. No, because it's it's it's, it's one. Right. Okay, so now we can start doing a numerical experiments, and we have these culprits that where we have MD trajectories. So we had some supercomputer run for some time, for some long time, um, and uh, so this is using density functional theory, and these are some acronyms for the connoisseur. This is um, PBE is one of the standard uh, DFT codes, and this is van der Waals uh, interactions. Okay, so this is f at 500k, um, and we have 1,000 confirmations per data set. Okay, so now we can look how good can we become in terms of energy prediction and in terms of force prediction. And then we can look at the trajectories of different chemical compounds. This is now the Uracil, um, uh, this is this compound, and we can predict the force magnitude and the energy magnitude, and what I have already said before, we can do this at a very high quality. You can see this because you don't see anything, except if you blow this up, then you can see a bit, right? So this is nice. So let's look at... Um, the usual model that we, you, you would use, so the usual model would be predicting the energy, taking the derivative. So we are doing a prediction of the vector field, but it should be a conservative one. And so, which is highly constraining, as I pointed out already several times. And um, now we can look at, for the different chemical compounds, we can look at the curve where um, we have the 1 kcal per mole curve, which is the curve of desired accuracy. And we can ask, how many data points do we need? And for example, for aspirin, this is something like, uh, I'm not sure, 1,000 or 2,000, 1,500. Um, for our model, which is highly constrained. And this would be uh, somewhere up here. It's like 53,000 or something like that. So there's a huge difference. Um, the other thing is we can look at the force um, estimates um, and the, the force accuracies. So also the force accuracies are nice. But um, we are directly predicting them. 
And this is, so to say, a derived quantity right, for the other method. So the difference is not so high. But the point that we want to make is, the, the relevant point that I want to make is, is this one. So if you go about doing MD and you use our method, then instead of running your computer 50,000 data points long, you just need 500 to have the same accuracy. And that does make a difference. Okay, but there's more, right? And we come to Tali. So, we know more about molecules than the clear laws of physics, namely energy conservation. We know that there are symmetries. Okay? So, highly, so you, you've seen benzene, which is super, no, it's not super symmetric, but it is symmetric. Okay? So, it has some symmetry axis, so you can, you know, to have a mirror symmetry and so on and so forth. But other than that, there's some compound. I mean, this is like an obvious symmetry. Um, it's called a rigid symmetry. But there are non rigid symmetries, and they're more interesting. So for some compounds, um, you have these beasts here. Okay, so there's the benzene ring, and there's some, some group, and th this group is rotating. Right? In MD, part of the MD trajectory is this group rotating. This is vibrating a bit, but then the group is rotating. Okay? So this is a so-called non-rigid symmetry. So what we've done so far, the exercise was to use energy conservation. And now we also know about these molecular symmetries. These are the rigid and also non-rigid symmetries. And the idea that we will follow now is that we actually look at, um, so this is the adjacency, adjacency matrix for some um, molecular graph, and we, have, we can have some transforms to that. Okay? And the question is, how can we use these transforms to get an accurate prediction of the energy surface at less data points? And just to give you a motivation for this is, so if you take a, some compound like that, so typically if you don't do anything, you need at least 50,000 data points. So we already saw we can have, get away with 500 to 2,000. But what I will show you is that we can also get away with 50 to 100. So this is a huge difference that this makes. Because if you think about 50,000 times 5 hours at the quantum chemical level that you have, maybe if you have only 50 data points, they may afford to use this super accurate quantum chemical calculation that takes 7 days per data point. The question is, why would you want to do this in the first place? So the sad thing is that um, these standard approximations, um, like PBE, they're very good. But if you look at the spectrum of the vibrations that, that you get from MD, they're not the same as the ones that you see in the experiment. Here it's different. If you, if you would be able to do this, then you would see the same things. But for obvious reasons, nobody has been able to uh, do 50,000 times seven days. This has just not been done because it's unfeasible. And we are now, uh, I will show you some data, which is unpublished, where we have done this. But of course, using all these symmetries. So we use all the symmetries, all the laws of physics to do that. And just, and this, this you know, it brings us to some very innocent computer science problem. Meaning, if you think about the molecules wiggling around, then if you go from one a time step to the next where something is changing, you need to identify the, mol uh, the, the same atoms of the graph. So you can do something like a bipartite matching. So if you take 
one graph and the other graph, you can look at the transformations that lead from here to there. Okay? So, there's a very nice paper by Umeyama um, that says we can solve this bipartite matching problem by doing an eigen decomposition on this side, on this side, and then to use the Hungarian algorithm to, to um, match the eigenvectors. Okay, so far so good. But this is only local. This is going from one step to the next step to the next step. But this is not globally consistent. So what you actually want is some global multipartite matching. Um, so in other words, if you think about this, again, the rotors, so this is now a rotor, okay? So if, you, if this is rotating, then you need to know that, that you're matching the right atoms in this rotor. Otherwise, it's not consistent. So, um, and, and for this, we can compute the um, um, minimum spanning tree, and then we get the right transformation that is globally consistent across this. And then we can construct a symmetry kernel, like a symmetric kernel for, all, for this whole thing, comparing the, um, the molecules. And then, so if, you, if we think about this molecule, which has two rotors, so we take the angle of, on one side of the rotor and the angle on the other side. It's, it's my second last slide. Huh? Um, then you can see that by, by, by the construction of this data set, it's not symmetric, but it should be. Right? Because they are fully symmetric, these rotors. And if you do this reconstruction where you have the global bipartite matching, uh, global multipartite matching, um, then you get the symmetric kernel which gives you a reconstruction that is meaningful, maybe symmetric. Okay? So in other words, we now have some tool in our hands where we have included all the symmetries the rigid and non-rigid symmetries. Of course, we use energy conservation, and then we can do the couple clustering a game, which is the higher level quantum mechanical calculations. And then we look at the non-symmetric model, and you can see that's the vibration spectrum of the MD simulation, and you can see that there are actually three peaks. And there shouldn't be, because this is a symmetric uh, molecule. There should be only two peaks just to, to look at this. this. This should be experimentally true. And if we use the symmetric model, we get the right peaks, just two of them. But we can make some more analysis in everything. And um, we can also correct for problems in the data density. But moreover, we have a fabulous, super accurate prediction. And it's the first time that somebody ever could do this. Okay? So, what I show today was we can do a bit of deep learning to get quantum chemistry in pace. The nice thing is that we can even do some our bit and, and share to understanding of the chemistry of that. So the models are not completely dumb, they actually reflect the chemistry. And um, the, the interesting question was, how do we learn with few data points? There was a, an ongoing discussion, and everybody discussed this from his perspective. So, so I think in, in um, many of the, the problems that we saw is that there's so much prior knowledge included in the data or in, in the models that you actually, uh, Lior was talking about this in the unsupervised case. So when you, when you restrict your model highly, then you can also learn with few data points. So here, we have a very clear motivation why to use few data points, and we have a clear motivation how to do it. Namely, we use the laws of physics. So that's our trick. Thank you. All right, uh, time for questions. So, very interesting, and this is maybe more of a chemically related question, but... Ooh, <laughs> I'm the only hobby chemist. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the, the molecules that you showed are all relatively simple in structure. Yes. Do you ever try with something more dynamic, such as small peptides? No, we haven't, and that's a big challenge, and nobody has, no. right? I mean, so people who do, you know, proteins and, and stuff, they all do classical uh, simulations, because it's way too, too hard. Right, or very simple quantum mechanical calculations. Um, maybe one more question. Did you try to see And uh, maybe just, just to add, because I mean, I'm just trying to... So, so the, the challenge here would be to, to, to make the problem solvable locally. Mm. Right? In a way, the deep network has a strategy like that. But, but um, in a way, you would like to decompose this nicely. And if you could decompose it nicely, then you could go to a larger molecules. But again, the, the problem here also is, is that you cannot get the data in the first place. Yeah. Okay, so please continue with your question. Oh, so the, the second question was, did you ever try to go on a bit and see how two molecules interact? Uh -huh. So you could imagine two benzene rings stacking through the Van der Waals forces. Well, um, azobenzene, right, is of course two uh, benzene rings connected and flapping together. But um, of course, no, we haven't, right? Because this is still one molecule. Um, although it does a lot of funny things, right? Um, so, but, um, you know, I think state of the art of, of some colleagues, for example, uh, um, Rob De Stasio in Princeton, he can do 64 water molecules at the quantum chemical accuracy. So this is super difficult. So, but in a way, you know, again, we've been doing this since 2011, before the field was not there, right? So, and therefore we have to be a bit, you know, more patient because we have to learn things, you have to understand things. And mm, I should say, um, I maybe I was a bit too strong saying that the field was not there. Of course, there was the field, um, but there was no heavy use in machine learning, um, not any any kind of modern methods, right? Oh, it's, it's all very impressive because it's oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it is all very impressive because I mean, right now, the, when you're doing docking or similar, then your biggest constraint is getting these simulated. Getting yes. The so, so I mean, just to to give you one one aspect, I mean. The, the understanding mol the, the quantum mechanical properties of molecules, I mean, although you think this is a bit strange, right? Um, it is actually re highly relevant because, um, for example, our colleague Alex Kachenko, who was, uh, was a co-author on this, he studied aspirin, okay? So we all know that aspirin works, okay? Um, so the question is why, okay? And he could show that you actually need the accuracy, uh, the quantum mechanical accuracy, where you include van der Waals in order to understand what is going on. So it's quite interesting that, that although many of these drugs have been around for a long time, it's actually not fully understood what, how they do things, and van der Waals or any kind of quantum chemical properties should be taken into account. Alex? Um, so first of all, I mean, this is really super nice. Uh, so I've got a question, and my guess is if I were a chemist, uh, I would probably wor uh, wonder or worry how the error distribution looks like, as in, you know, is it sort of kind of correct most of the time, or do you yes. have occasional catastrophic outliers? Yes. And, and if you have the latter, then why? Yes. So, so I think, um, so we have, I mean, the, this is typically in our publications, so we, we always report the max error. So typically this is, Mm, I mean, we have few you know, sort of catastrophic errors. Um, there are, you know, I, I, I cannot quantify this, but it's in the paper. So it's, it's not, so you can look at the error distribution. It is very, very thin and small. Now, there's an interesting thing is you base your uh, um, machine learning on quantum chemical calculations. So similarly to machine learning models, the quantum chemical cal calculations need babysitting. And there are some aspects where you actually, you know, systematically get wrong answers. So sometimes you are wrong, and you look at the errors, 
but this may not be a machine learning error. So, but in many cases, of course, you make machine learning errors. And this is actually interesting because we need to understand this. And so, so I think your question is very valid, but we don't have huge catastrophic errors, just to give a short answer. Yeah, thank you very much for a really nice talk. It's always fascinating to see how machine learning can improve things in natural science. Uh, I, I'm wondering uh, if uh, there is a space for kind of reverse problem when you try, uh, tr try to reconstruct uh, parameters of the molecule given the, the dynamics uh, measurement or, or some kind of observation that, that you have from experiment. Mm. So did, did you look at this kind of problem? I, I understand <clears throat> it's kind of out of scope of your talk, but... Yeah, I mean, um, so um, we thought about it, and there's some ongoing projects, but we don't have anything to report at the moment. So all these results were results where we used quantum chemical simulations, not experimental data, right? And so there's a nice uh, project that Christoph is involved in, um, which, um, you know, is a collaboration with Jülich, where someone is um, pulling molecules off a surface with his microscope tip. And um, the question is how to properly model this and how to understand this nicely. Um, and in particular, the modeling part is difficult because it's a super complex uh, quantum chemical problem. Yeah, it seems kind of a common, common topic or common uh, field of research because in high energy physics, similar problems arise uh, every so often. For example, how do you tune your simulation to be most accurate towards yes. the uh, process that you tried with, to, to describe, to, to explain? So yeah, I think that the, the issue is, uh, ideally, if you would ask around, then, then people would like to do this, this super high-level quantum chemical calculation. Ideally, right? Because that is hoped to actually be be, um, you know, on the same page as the experiment. Also, there's a very interesting hypothesis that has been around. Um, namely, if, if you do a lower-level quantum chemical calculation, you compute the potential energy surface, there may be some ripples in it. And um, the interesting hypothesis is, if you would be able to do a higher level of quantum chemical cal calculations. <laughs> this is not getting more detailed, the ripples, but rather it's smoothed out. It's actually, the ripples are an artifact of the simulation. So, of course, there's no way to, to test this unless you have methods which, which allow you to, to actually learn with few data points. Okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and the final part. Uh, did you try any generative adversarial networks uh, to, to see if they improve things in any, in any sense? Well, I think that, that um, one of the issues here is that we have very few data points. So I don't see uh, it easy to train uh, models uh, with very few data points in the, that context. So if we have 100 data points, maybe not for a generalized adversary model. If we take Christoph's case, um, where we have 100,000 data points, we couldn't start talking about this. But I think um, already now the question is, point three is already, you know, a dream for people. So I think it's a question whether uh, to, you know, push this further down or whether to actually get some insights. So we always choose to rather go to get some insights. So, thank you. So, it's, it's great how the number of, para of data has been reduced in order to, I guess, get the same results. Yes. Um, and then from those data, you can actually run a different simulation to get even a better result. Exactly. Now, do you suspect that there is a... Um, a kind of minimum description length for molecules out there that you kind of uh, 
you have a certain uh, when I when I look at sampling rates and minimum description lengths for other stochastic mm. processes or for other um, uh, aspects that we are worried about, like when we take camera mm. observations of mm. objects, then we uh, there's a minimum amount of camera views in the sampling scenario. Mm -hmm. Now you take measurements or data or whatever numbers, and you reduce them and you reduce them. Do you suspect there is a minimum number that's related to a certain molecule structure? Yes. The answer is yes. Because if you think about it, um, if you, if you, um, so think about just one bowl, right? So no, no complex um, structures. So, so then you can, you can think how many forces, force samples you need and how many energy samples or, or, um, um, coordinates of your of your molecule you need it's like a Nyquist thing right so if this is a regular structure now in these molecules the the, the structure is not as simple so you may I mean it's not clear how I mean if it was clear how the potential energy surface would look like with a lot of minima around that all matter because the one it makes the rotor turn, and the other one, you know, makes the molecule flap, and so on and so forth. So you can you can reason about them once you have found them, right? You found these states, and and so ideally, you need at every kind of state and for every kind of transition, you may need some data points. So it's a, it's a bit like a Nyquist thing, except that you don't know what the frequency is. And yeah, so that's uh, of course that that. that 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 is right. <laughs> so, I, I I yes, yes, that's right. All right, great. Let's thank Lars over again.